Welcome to our career webinar, What in the World? Your Path to Becoming an Expert in Robotic Process Automation and Process Improvement. We're here with Laura Hendricks, Senior VP of and Director of Enterprise RPA and Process Improvement and Quality at First Horizon Bank. And I'll introduce Laura in a moment, but first just to orient you to the controls on WebEx, um, we will have a Q&A session toward the end of the webinar, so please enter your questions for Laura in the Q&A box, hit send, and uh, you can use the chat function. Remember to set it to host and presenter or all panelists so that we see your questions or comments. Um, and again, if you ask questions in the chat box, we will get to those toward the end as well. Um, we're going to be doing several polls during presentation and I'm going to start with this basic poll. So how much experience do you have? And how are you feeling today? We asked this one since the pandemic started just to make sure that um, folks are handling work from home and the other factors you know it can be a stressful time. Give you another 15 seconds. And interesting poll result. But we find that um, most people, a little more than half, have more than five years experience, but there's quite a few who are currently studying in college. And it's nice to see that uh, most of you are feeling well today. Uh, for the few who are not, we hope that yeah, by the end of the presentation, you'll be feeling better for having some great information from Laura. So let's go ahead and Close the poll window. Introduce Laura. She, as I mentioned, is the Senior Vice President and Director of Enterprise Robotics Automation, Robotic Process Automation, RPA, and Process Improvement and Quality at First Horizon Bank. So she has an engineering background, started in civil engineering, and um, has worked as the global quality leader for Federal Express and now is at First Horizon Bank. She specializes in facing and overcoming challenges in business that help other people's visions become reality. And she develops creative solutions by working collaboratively with the various stakeholders at the bank to create new ways of doing business. And that kind of gets us into the title of the presentation, What in the World? Can you tell tell us a little bit more about that, um, Laura? Of course. So of course. When Julie and I first spoke, um, we were talking about the typical day in RPA and also touched on process improvement. And I mentioned to him that there is no typical day in RPA. Uh, basically, every day we start with uh, knowing that the unexpected may come our way. And the four most used words I have in my vocabulary at the morning at, at the moment is "what in the world." And he decided to um, he decided to name that this topic for this webinar. So basically, uh, would you like for me to Stuart, give a little overview on, on robotic process automation, RTA, yes. right now, yes, to say why that is? Uh, it's really the nature of uh, RPA, robotic process automation, because the, the very value in robotic process automation is that we work with user interfaces, which by that I mean screens. Uh, and we also have the underlying systems, the underlying softwares, et cetera. So there's a, a, just a numerous uh, number of possibilities for, for failures in there and, and glitches, 
Uh, since the pandemic, we've also been challenged with, with Wi-Fi latency. And uh, so there's just a, a lot of, of areas that can fail and, and do at times uh, fail, and then we have no way of predicting. Those things that we have ways of predicting, we do, but there's still a lot of moving parts. And so that's that's why we have, have to expect the unexpected all the time. A particular challenge that came with COVID and the pandemic uh, last March when we went remote, I was working in back office operations at the bank and, and many of our employees were not set up with laptops at that time. And so those employees transitioned to laptops. The laptops were newer than what, what we had. So they were faster at the same time. They moved to their homes with their own slower Wi-Fi connections. And so we had we had a disconnect and, and we had to um we had to work with that and we did. So so we've accommodated that. Very interesting and very challenging work. Yeah, and and as you said, varied in the terms of you never know exactly what the next challenge is going to be. I, I think I mentioned when we spoke, um, I had heard an executive and I haven't been able to track down exactly who said it, but it was very soon after the beginning of work from home. And she said, you know, if they had told us that we had to convert everyone to work from home, we would have said, great, give us six months and $10 million and we'll do it. And when it happened and they said, everybody go home within three days, Everybody was working from home with no budget. So um, I, being able to solve those problems with that, that kind of agility is, is really a remarkable area to work in. Um, so I had a question. How do RPA and business process improvement dovetail together? That they dovetail together for first of all, when we are asked to automate something, we look at the process, you know, from, from the beginning of the process to the end of the process. Many of these processes have not been designed as they are from start to finish. They basically started out at A, then that got added on to B, then C came in, D, E, and so the process is, is not a really good process. And so when we're looking at those processes, we a lot of times we have to improve those processes before we even automate. And the, the way I have to explain it to the process owners is if we automate a broken process, we're going to create a real fast mess is, is what we're going to do. And so we have to go back to the drawing board and look at that process and optimize that process before we automate. And so that's where, where we really dovetail in. It's a, a very interesting what we have at the bank, and, and I love it because we um, we have I'm the director over our quality process improvement program and also the RPA. Uh, prior to this, in other other not banks but other enterprises, what we've had is that the the process improvement side. Uh, you know, here and the RPA here, and and there wasn't a joint joining together. But but we have developed the programs here where they're they're dovetailed in, and so we really uh, we have a, a synergy going there. That's that's great. Yeah, and I had um, spoken with a scientist from Salesforce who studies decision quality, and. He um, mentioned that in that particular area where you have your data scientists and analysts working on artificial intelligence and, and things that can help in decision making. And then you have the business side, which says these are the challenges that we need to solve and this is what we want to find out. Um, he pointed out that um, it's not just a one way street where the business says, here, solve this problem. and the data scientists say, oh yeah, here's the solution, um, that often it's the data scientists coming back with, this is what we think is possible. This is something that we think we could get out of the data. And would this be useful to you? And so that kind of uh, circular flow um, gets to better solutions and, and better decision support systems. 
and I imagine it's the same for you where knowing all three aspects of it, which is the, the business owner's needs, the process improvement view, and what's possible to do with process automation, RPA, um, gives you that kind of um, a, what I call a, a virtuous cycle where everybody's adding to each other's capabilities. Is that, that fair? That That's very fair. And, and I love that analogy with the circle because that's where our quality program, process improvement program comes in with, with that circular continuous process improvement. Sure. And what, what we do when it's a very large process improvement is we, we switch it over to the to the quality program side first and we engage all the stakeholders and basically what it is is not a, a tennis game of this person throwing this over the ball and then over the court and then that one hitting it and coming back basically what it is is brainstorming together so that that we can arrive at the best solution and so uh, my team acts in those cases as facilitators and as facilitators we're not pushing our own agenda uh we don't we're not necessarily pushing rpa we just want the best process sometimes that eliminates rpa totally out of the picture and, and that's fine. And so, like I said, we're not we're, we're not evangelists for RPA in that role. We we are just trying to get to the best solution for the bank. Yeah, yeah. kind of reminds me of the of the riddle about the truck that gets stuck under the, the the highway overpass, the railroad overpass, and nobody can figure out what to do. They're thinking about even deconstructing the overpass to get the truck out. And a little boy comes up and says, "Mister, I know what to do." Um, and 10 minutes later, the truck is free. And, and it turns out what the little boy said was, why don't you just let some air out of the tires? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, like, like you said, sometimes it's not looking for the complex solution. It's, it's just recognizing when there's a simple, simple solution that you can arrive at. Um, but when you're looking for the complex solutions, I mean, one of the questions I had was, what is it like for your team members to work in, in in this area and what are some of the kinds of projects that they they get called on to, to work on we get called now from all departments across the enterprise so we work with hr we work with loan operations we're currently standing up some citizen developers in our fraud department we work uh, within our IT department. We have citizen developers in the um, ID management department. And so what, what they are faced with is a multitude of different processes. And some, sometimes it can be a process that's in one department. And sometimes this process can, can overstep the boundaries and engage several different departments. And so uh, that that's what they do. Uh, typically, when we have these that, that really are overstepping uh, multiple departments, especially if they need process improvement, then we do take them to our quality program side and form that team. And that can that can be 15 to 20 uh, members on that team. And we we identify all the stakeholders and uh, they, they become involved with that when um, so when that happens Stuart my my RPA team then is not involved on 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 this side with us while we're doing this process improvement until we determine it's actually automated that that we what we're going to automate and so then then I pull in my team members that that work on process improvement so if they're the ones that are working on process improvement then get involved in facilitating these meetings uh, and uh and and running that process right? you kind of have to trust the process uh, it's counterintuitive people that have been involved with six sigma or lean it, it they they understand uh we we're having to train and teach uh, our enterprise at the bank uh, on these on this process of of brainstorming and, and really getting to know the process before we move to solution everybody you know no matter where we are and human nature says we want the solution and so we we have to go back to study it so it really depends upon which side of of 
of the uh, fence you're on on my team, whether you're on the quality process improvement side or you're on the automation side, frankly, most uh, the ones that are on the quality side right now are also in RPA. Okay. Um, what are the, the kinds of both hard technical skills and soft skills that, that people need to be successful in those two half, you know, two parts of the role, either on the process improvement side or on the RPA side or, you know, together? So for us on the process improvement side, the technical skills are not as important as the soft skills. That side really requires a lot of soft skills. There's a lot of change management that goes on. Um, people very very resistant to change management. This is this is global, by the way. This is yeah. across all yeah. industries and all enterprises. But people just add, you're fine with it as long as you're the one changing that making other people change. But try someone else coming into your world or my world and telling me that my process needs to be improved and changed. And, and I, even I'm in like, well, well, I'll do it. My I'll do it myself. Okay, I'll I'll change, but I'll do it myself. And and so that's where the soft skills come in because you can get, uh, this happens very, very rarely, but you can get on teams what is called storming. Um, you come from an engineering background as well, Stuart, so you know the, the stages of team development. You can, and, and that storming can get can get quite heated. Where, and so you just kind of step off the stage and and let everybody go back down. So you have to have those soft skills so that that you not only respond when it happens, but you prevent that happening. Uh, it's not always preventable, but but so that you prevent that happening. So listening a lot uh, instead of, of speaking, and a lot of what we do as facilitators is that we, we pull the information from the subject matter experts. What, uh, what on that side of the house, what's really interesting is that uh, until people become familiar with what we do, they don't understand why we're facilitating it because we don't have a clue about their department or their process. And yes. so, but they come to learn that it's not, we're not the subject matter expert on their department or their processes. However, we are able to follow the process to engage everyone and, and try to work toward a, the best solution. So that, that's what's needed on that side of the house uh, most is the soft skills. And um, we'll, we'll move to the RPA side. There are basically two, two departments on my RPA side. One is the business analyst. And what they do is they work directly with the business process owners and they learn about the process and then they take that information and they put it into a document that's called a process uh, process uh, definition document. And that document is then handed off to the developers to develop that those team members need strong soft skills as well. And they need uh, strong, you know, write, not writing skills, but need need to be able to put put words on paper and and be very organized in that. Right. Uh, not as many technical skills needed there. And then you move over from there. You move over to the developers, and that's where you have a higher need for technical skills, but not like a system developer. You don't need Java, you know, code. And, and all that, and that's that's beautifully beauty of robotic process automation because it's more of a, a plug and play. It's a more user friendly, and so it's quicker to pick up. However, the the developers still uh, the way they think, the way they uh, come across the developers uh, and develop these automations, that technical experience and that training and thinking that way. Uh, to go through an if then else statement by those that for folks that don't have that kind of uh, a background, uh, what what we do a lot is you, you'll have if if this and then you take this road or you take that road. And so you you become trained in your mind to work that way. And so on that side, from a technical standpoint, that's what that is. We have had a very rare occasions when, when we've uh, when we've had to to go back to to some code, uh, but the, that's very rare and far far between. Yeah. 
but it's mainly where it's mainly systems level thinking at that at that stage where you're you need to understand like you said the the logic of the workflow you need to understand what paths and branches you need to construct but uh, you don't necessarily have to reduce it down to the level of the code. You've got the modules that will do each function for you. That's correct. And and there's several different RPA software programs. And so just because you are experienced in one doesn't mean you can walk in day one and and do the other, but that the learning curve is is a lot faster on that than, than picking up and being real fluent in Java or, or something else like that. Where does the, what part of your, your, your operation, your, which team does the Lean Six Sigma thinking uh, fall into? That's the that's the quality program, the process improvement side. Also, we try we we train and, and get our our business analysts to be able to recognize when they're first going into the processes and reviewing them that the processes are are kind of broken processes or inefficient processes, and uh, and then they they ask us you know what should be done. And then, then we go in and look at it. They become just by experience and, and working with us and seeing what we do, they become much more knowledgeable about what needs to go back to the drawing board first. Um, so on the process improvement side, some of the, the, the skills, Lean Six Sigma, as we just mentioned, but also things like um, <clears throat> program management and project management type skills and the change management that's associated with those. Exactly. I, by the way, have, have you ever seen the movie um, Wayne's World, you know, the old uh, comedy film Wayne's World? No. Sorry. Um, it was based on the, based on the skit from uh, Saturday Night Live, um, and there's a scene in it where one of the, the main characters is at a um, high tech company and watching a demonstration of a robot, this little robot sitting on the table doing something, and suddenly he, the guy picks up a hammer and starts bashing the thing into little pieces, and then the guy looks at him like, "What have you just done?" and he says, we fear change. <laughs> that is, <laughs> that, that is that's, true. That's, that's kind of one of the one of the great skills I think that uh, your, your folks need to have is to face the universal fear of change. Like you said, it's great if I if it's my idea to make somebody else change, but they probably don't think it's a great idea for me to make them change. So. Yeah, that's that's correct, Stuart. And and you have in training like Lean Six Sigma. I, you know, I I've had a lot of training in Lean Six Sigma. I'm I'm a I'm a nerd, and I'm kind of a, a certification addict, really. But um, having that kind of training and also project management training trains you how to how to go about that and how to adapt and to know when to back off and to know when to come forward and kind of uh, to manage those instances so um if somebody in our audience um, and i'm presuming that's one of the reasons why people have joined us today um if, if people in our audience are looking at uh, entering into this type of field either on the rpa side or on the process improvement side what kinds of skill areas should they focus on uh, preparing themselves. What are the what are the uh, aside from we talked in general about the kinds of soft and hard skills, but what kinds of certifications, for example, might they be looking at getting? So on the process improvement side, and I'll just give it from my background and what I did. Uh, but on the process improvement side, it would be the the lean training, the Six Sigma training. Uh, what whatever you can can do on that side and get that training 
And also on that side, just just as an encouragement, I did not start out on a, a, a process improvement team. And but although it fascinated me, I did not do that. And so what I had control over was the process of my own computer right right at my own cubicle yes. right at my own desk I, and i started this even when i was in civil engineering because that standardization and being able to improve my productivity and everything that comes out of, of all that uh, fascinated me and so um i had no influence on anyone else in my company but i did have influence over right what was in within three feet of me right and so what i did was i took those concepts and the things that i was learning and i implemented them in my very own processes that's really an interesting thing to do and that's what i encourage people to do and uh, as an outcome of that my productivity became noticed and the efficiency and speed that the executives could see see my work and and i could be responsive improved and so I, I used whatever I could, macros in Excel. I didn't have robotic process automation, et cetera. And so that, that's what I used to do that. And so that's the skills you need to do uh, is improve on that side is to improve your knowledge of Lean and Six Sigma, standardization processes, et cetera. Um, you, you touched on project management, and that is critical. Uh, if whether you're in process improvement or you're on the the um, RPA side, so that that benefits you from both those. And and incidentally, the Lean Six Sigma and the project management is across industries and across whatever you're doing. Even if you're not concentrating on this, if if you have a job and you're asked to to produce to a certain goal or a certain deadline you better be managing it like a pro like a, pro a project uh, so project management comes in and so then on the um on the rpa side uh well there's a lot out there you can google there's um simply learn there's there's a lot of different offerings that you have that are available to you, and if you if you don't know what you want to do, um, they're also most of the software companies offer free online training to get get your foot in the water and see if that's really something you want to want to pursue. Um, just a word of caution, though don't be uh, don't be turned away from it if you if you do that because you'll be you'll be self teaching and and sometimes it's not as intuitive as as possible because of uh you know the the people that are testing it and they're producing it come from most of the time more technological world and so don't get discouraged but if it interests you that you know that's a good way to look at it and see if it interests you more right um and yeah we found that um offering um certain parts of our our um, training for free lets people like you said get a, a feel for it and determine where are the areas that they might want to move forward and, and take more intensive training but yeah it, um what would you recommend laura to to people who want to stand out to employers you talked about your own personal experience and how you developed um the uh productivity tools that you wanted to to work on um things personally that made you more effective and how that stood out to your management so when you when we have people who are either trying to do exactly what you did which is to stand out to their current management to move up or want to stand out to prospective employers what what things would you recommend them to do to do to follow in that path so first of all Stuart, don't wait for somebody else to tell you what what you need to do to stand out what what i did and what i encourage everyone to do um, if you're wanting to stand out at your current employer even if you're not wanting to stand out at your current employer uh, but but you want to stand out in general if you are employed right now and I understand some of you may not be 
but if you are employed right now, you need to stand out at your current employer. And for several reasons is that, that employers look to see what your past history has been. And I know in my roles at, with process improvement and with RPA, what I'm looking at as an employer is for not necessarily the exact uh, experience in either of these areas, but, but a curiosity, a willingness to learn and being proactive in doing that. Now, what I did it to develop myself and to stand out was I proactively looked for ways that I could improve what I was doing. And as an offset to that, that was naturally noticed from up above and um, I was able to produce more. They they were getting what they liked better in a better format, quicker, et cetera. And so th that's what I did. And so that that is how I stood out. Another thing I did and, and something I encourage people to do is a lot of times people have the mentality that they're not going to go the extra mile if they're not paid to go the extra mile. And so you're really doing yourself a disservice there. Go the extra mile for yourself, no matter whether it's more money in your pocket at that time or not. I, I really think that one of the reasons I am where I am today is because I, I went that extra mile and, and I and I proactively looked for those opportunities and didn't have it tied to a, a dollar amount of, I'm not gonna do that unless I'm paid a certain amount. And, and so I, I proactively said, I think we can improve this here and, and this is what I can do to do it. And I didn't wait for them to pay me more to do it. Once they said, go ahead and go for it, um, I did it. Um, another, th and along that line also, I also, um, Stuart alluded to me, uh, managing the quality program at, at FedEx. It was at one of the smaller operating companies at FedEx and, and I volunteered to do that uh, because there was a hiring freeze and uh, my managing director needed somebody to do that. I volunteered to do that as a second job and ended up doing that as a second job, uh, which you know was was not again not paid, but not paid like that. But it paid me back in spades because of my experience I earned. But I ended up doing that for four, for a year. Invaluable, just invaluable. No money at that time difference, but just invaluable in the long run. What I encourage people to do, Stuart, that are not employed right now and they're trying to get back into employment is to volunteer. And if it, if you volunteer at a soup kitchen, even if you're cooking soup, uh, volunteer at the soup kitchen and, and cook the soup. While you're there, you may see processes that can be improved. People may not want you to. Again, we're talking about change resistance, but but try to see if there are things that you can work on there to help them with their processes. <laughs> but decide you want to go into RPA or you're already working on RPA, uh, see if there's anything there, a project that you can work on to help them in these nonprofits. There's tremendous needs. Uh, and see if you can volunteer to produce automations for them. Uh, most of the software companies now will give you a community edition of the softwares for, for these instances and you can work with them. And that's how you gain the experience. That's how you gain the experience when you don't have the experience. Yeah, and we've, we've had the advice from uh, um, people talking about development careers, careers in uh, software development. Um, and they've said something similar in the sense of a universal recommendation is to get involved in open source uh, software projects and demonstrate that you're giving to the community in the form of, of doing the work, improving the code, adding to the repository and that type of thing. And yeah, certainly it applies far more broadly than just open source software. Like you said, any type of volunteer work that you do gives you um, things you can point to that say, you know, I'm proactively doing something to help and to keep myself engaged. And, and uh, what would you 
look for personally when you're looking at um, applicant or looking for you know if you're what what do you want to see on on the resume are, are are there particular things that people should highlight and what are the things that maybe people think are important that aren't so important to you as an employer well first of all the things that that i look for i really look for a curiosity for learning you know and a past history of, of constantly learning because we have to constantly and continuously learn. I have to constantly and continuously learn. I also look for someone who uh, does not want to be instructed all the time and, and does not have to be told what how to do something. Basically, when we have these what in the world moments, there's not any written procedures. And so they have to be that not just willing to jump in, but really enjoy jump jumping in and, fi and figuring things out and so uh that's what what i look for i don't i don't so i don't look so much for um i don't look for for coding experience and that that uh, type of experience uh if we're on the uh process improvement side and the ba side i look for those soft skills and again, don't don't care so much about the technical skills. Other industries, if you're in process improvement and, and quality, they're they're you know like manufacturing. They may want uh, higher expertise in statistical analysis, et cetera. That's not necessary in, in banking in my area, and so I don't look for that. Okay. Um, do you put a, a emphasis on educational background and those kinds of qualifications or are you looking more at the work experience and and showing that people have been eager to take on projects and and been eager to learn new things i look at either or and so okay. so that, that there's a trade-off because you can get highly educated through experience and depending upon what what um, life has provided you, a lot of some people have not had the benefit of being able to spend a lot of focused time uh, on on getting particular degrees, et cetera. But but if those same people have show that they've been proactive and they have the experience, then that that weighs out there. Um. I think you've really talked about it with, in terms of you know, talking about perpetual curiosity and, and continuous learning, but um, if somebody is working on your team or in, in, in a similar function in another company, um, what would your advice, Laura, be to them to keep their career moving forward? The same type that I would give um, those that are on this webinar really learn continuously. Never, ever, ever stop stop learning. Um, you know, technology is continuously moving ahead of us. It's always getting ahead of us. If you just stand still for any period of time, you're getting behind. So you're not staying, you know, in, in this same platform if you're not totally trying to, to learn. I encourage my team, we have tuition reimbursement at the bank. We had that also at FedEx. Um, I, I, I regret to say that I didn't always take advantage of that uh, pr prior to, to this experience. But now, I, you know, if you have tuition or certification reimbursement, where you're working, take advantage of that. If you're not currently working, look for look for areas where you can get certified for free. Uh, particularly right now with COVID and so many people being displaced, there's a, there's a lot of uh, companies that are that are offering free training. Take advantage of the Simply Learn free uh, to to see what you want. That may take you off on a completely totally different path. And so uh, to take advantage of it, but I encourage my team, don't don't lose that tuition certification money each year. Don't do that. 
um, also take advantage of the free training and uh, I'm big on I'm big on YouTube. You know, if, if I don't understand, I, I shared with you, Stuart, when, when I was going to the Harvard Business Analytics program and I would fall back on uh, when it got to the technical area, I'm but mainly from the business area. And so when it came to IT topics, I'd say, well, that's not my area of expertise. And one of my colleagues at Harvard one time challenged me and, and asked me and said, Laura, do, do you know of any businesses that aren't highly reliant on technology? And I had to say, no, that I didn't. And so he said, well, it needs to become your area of expertise. Uh, fortunately, I was able to be honest and open enough to him to tell him that it was overwhelming to me because there were so many terms and, and things that I didn't understand. And so he had come from the IT side of banking and gone to the business side. And he said that he had that same uh, on the reverse. He had that same feeling of being overwhelmed on the reverse. And he recommended that I take one term at a time and watch YouTubes until I understood it and then go on to the next term. And so um, that's what I would encourage everybody to do right now, whether you're employed, whether you're not employed, you know, just be curious and, and use whatever means you can to educate yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point, Laura, is that we encounter things that we have never heard of before in our work somebody mentions a term or a, a new area or something the other day somebody mentioned nft and nft is a non-fungible token the the reason i knew what it was was because i have friends who are artists who use this technology to protect their digital artwork um, it's a way to, to use blockchain technology to make a particular digital file unique and uh, therefore make it like a signed copy of a physical um, artwork. Um, but you don't need to have friends who are in the business <laughs> to, to hear a term like that and say, what does that mean? Because we all have Google and we all have, you know, the, the, the articles being written about our area or other areas of business and technology. And if you hear something like that, you can start taking that path, find out what it is. And like you said, then you can look into you know, the YouTube tutorials and find out the basics about it. And you may end up learning something that, that will take you in a different direction, even in your, your career. So um that curiosity and that that willingness to to follow those trails wherever they lead um is it's a wonderful thing and it's easier to do than it's ever been before um i think we're at a point where we should go on to ask questions that have come in from the audience so we've had a lot of people um who are, are very curious to hear from you and so i'm going to um pick out a few of these um First off, kind of a technical question, is RPA a replacement for test automation? I'm not sure what they're making by test automation. Yeah, no, what, what I'm thinking of is that um, the, the questioner is asking about um, the automation of software testing and how you'd use the, whether RPA would be helpful in that and you know from my perspective and i don't know whether yours is different um the test automation tools are are essentially a kind of rpa specifically for that purpose so i'm not sure that it's a it's really considered an overlap and we haven't um, gotten into that area in it with it with with rpa stewart um, I do recall, I think, I believe I've seen some use cases uh, for that uh, that have been presented, but we haven't gotten into that area. And so for, for that, the person asking that question, what I would, again, we're talking about Google. I mean, I'm not paid by Google, but but if, you, um, if you're interested to know if RPA is useful in a particular area, what, what I do when I'm going into a different department at the bank is I Google RPA use cases and then I add that area. 
and uh, you will come up with different information. Yep, and, and it turns out that the same questioner asked about these cases for RPA. Um, so one of the things you might advise then is for them to um, just use that as a search term in, in Google and say RPA use case and, and add the, the area that they're curious about Correct, and also if they want to add the industry, um, they, they'll have better uh, results back if, if it's general. Uh, so you're not in the you're not in the finance industry, or you're not in the health industry. Uh, you'll come back with more use cases. But but as simplistic as it sounds, that is also what I do when I'm going into a different department. If, if somebody in the, another department within the bank asks me how they might be able to utilize RPA, I, I'm able to find a lot of information like that, white papers, et cetera. In general, what are, what are the advantages of RPA? Um, how is it, probably a general question we could have started the webinar with, but how has it changed from the kind of business process automation or uh, improvement rather that I did when I started my career untold years ago. It's much faster to stand up, much, much faster to stand up. If you envision rather than having line by line code that was previously done and having all of the technology uh, developers that, that are very highly skilled, tied up with doing that line to line code for us to take uh, you take this module, plug it in here and put the parameters and then you take this module basically and plug it in there and plug in the parameters. And so it's much, much quicker. It takes uh, a lot less of the the technology department, the IT department to to do this. And so that being said, you know, there's a lot of things RPA cannot do that IT and the highly skilled developers have to do. But for that portion that we can, we take that load off them. Plus we're able to get back to the to, to the end users very quickly. The turnaround time can can be a lot faster. And by, by that um, our average turnaround time for developing is about uh, two and a half months. But as what we're getting better with that all the time when you're looking at it projects you can as you know Stuart, you can be looking at possibly years to eat to even get in line uh sure. and, and that's pretty pretty standard across enterprises but and so you know that's where where rpa the sweet spot of rpa we've also um as our program matures we also with our change management and highly regulated environment even so, we've been able to stand up automations and get a turnaround time and have them in production in four days, which is unusual. And not only is it unusual, I don't want any, any if any executives see this to think that they can expect that of their employees of our, or their RPA team because it took it took everybody from the seat being on call 24 seven to be able to ac accomplish that kind of turnaround. So unless they're willing to be woken up that that's not going to happen. Yeah, I understand how that. Um, we have a, a, a an attendee who says I'm finishing a certificate um, in process management. We, um, would RPA be an extension or uh, uh, to the knowledge of process and project management or does it take you in a different field? In other words, if you're if you're studying uh, PMO and and, um, P and you're PMP certified and you're you're studying Lean Six Sigma, um, would you recommend adding uh, a focus on RPA to to your toolkit for a person like that? Absolutely, that's what I did. Uh, my background is not in RPA. Right, and so I, prior to to getting the mentality of that not being my area of expertise, it fascinated me. I knew what it could do, but but me adding that on to my Lean Six Sigma expertise and, and background was a pivotal point in my life, and so I, I highly recommend it. Um, what advice would you give to people who are maybe from a non-technical background? 
who want to enter into this type of field, um, what path in, in would you suggest and, and um, what path forward? I would suggest starting out as a business, an RPA business analyst and uh, start starting that role at an entry level and then um, and then move into it, you can go different directions with that uh, once you become knowledgeable as a business analyst you will you will probably pretty naturally decide whether you want to to manage process improvement and lean six sigma or if you want to go into the uh, other side if you would like to become a developer but but business analysts too are just uh, that's a the real good field. It's a good entry field if you decide you want to stay in that field, stay in that field. But uh, it's not as technical as the developer side, and not quite. It's not as challenging on the soft skill side as doing the process improvement. So that just that business anal, RPA business analyst. Um, we have a questioner who's says she has a bachelor's degree in mathematics and, and a master's in computer science uh, with experience in quality and, uh, and quality analysis of products. And what would you advise is, a, is, is this a good fit? Is this person a good fit for um, the process improvement and, and RPA world? Uh, yes. I do, and I think basically RPA is going to go across every every industry, every department, every feature. And if you if you start reading on what what's projected for RPA, it's uh, just uh, an exponential growth. And so, uh, I to, for me, from my standpoint, what I'm seeing and what I'm reading. That that uh, for for really if you're if you're prone to to be interested in that path, it's a smart smart route to go, no matter what. Now, now, Stuart, does her does her background sound to you like it's a more of a manufacturing type uh, product product? I think yeah, it's it's it. That's the kind of uh, feeling I get from from her question. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's gonna be more. Yeah. Yeah, so that's so that's that's really um, that's what what I'm getting to. And that being said, so for you, if you you're always more valuable in the same type area where you have experience, but but if you're wanting to to move on in, but but take a look um, at some of the ways that you could uh, use this and do some research on how you could use RPA in what you've experienced. It's a really kind of a, a new way of thinking about the world. It opens up how, if you look back on what you've done in that product area and think about what could have been automated or if you're still in that area, still employed in that area, what could be automated, um, it, it will open up your mind to start thinking in those areas and you'll be able to, to find your way with that. But it, it, for, for me, like I said, the the Potential is just enormous. Uh, um, I have a question uh, from someone who asks if you believe that uh, business analysis certification is critical to, to success in this field. I don't know that the certification is critical to the success in it, but I will tell you this. I have um, one of my su most successful uh, business analysts has is, is just been promoted to offshore manager and he, he went the route of getting the business analyst certification to, to break into the RPA field. Uh, whether it was his innate, um, you know, way of work ethic or, or whatever, I can't attribute that to. But but I know that certainly uh, what I've seen from from that is is very impressive. It's very impressive. And and by the way, if, if with the business analyst certification, I think too the skills that you learn in that are also transferable if you decide not to do RPA. Because what you'll learn in that business analyst certification is to be able to take what you're seeing from from the the business process owners 
and communicating it on paper. And so whether you're in RPA or you go into any other area, even if you go into sales, uh, if you get completely away, that type of training still will help you be able to better uh, assimilate what you're hearing and then regurgitate it back. Yep, I, I, I can attest to that in, in terms of sales. If, if you're doing any kind of complex system selling, it's just vital to be able to understand the customer's problem from that level in order to be able to, to match what you're offering as a solution. So um, we have one more question um, I think is fascinating, which is, you know, what are the what are the possible problems you might encounter um, in a, a process improvement project and how would you overcome them? And I think that's a, a interesting question for you, Loris, and you might draw on your experience of you know some of your more challenging projects and say, you know, this is the roadblock we ran into, and this is this is how we got past it. Uh, so yes, that's that's interesting, and you do receive this because there are roadblocks. It's not Pollyanna, and uh, and so that's what part of the training does. W one of the things that that you run into um, a lot of times, especially if you are if you're not coming from a fresh start, if you're actually addressing an issue that has occurred. The first thing that's going to happen is this blame game, you know, and so people are going to say it's their fault, it's their fault. And, and um, so in your training, you are trained how to do not, hopefully you are. I, I know I, I received the, the bulk of my training at FedEx, which is, you know, that was fabulous. But um, but in the in the training that we received is is don't engage in that blame game and not to let the team engage in that blame game. One of the first global um, quality teams that I led, and they called them uh, quality, uh, they call them quality action teams, quads at FedEx. But one of the first ones I led um, was was a global um, quality team, and uh, and I immediately got that, uh, and it was that the the people. Uh, I won't say what part of the world we're blaming the people in the other part of the world. They were asking me who was the last one that touched it, who did this and that. So, so I, you know, but with my training and the excellent training I had received there, I knew to say, I'm not going to tell you. I, I mean, I was telling people that were way, way higher up in the ladder than I was, but I'm not going to tell you that because we're not focusing on the people, we're focusing on the process. Uh, and so, that comes into another challenge is a lot of times people will want to change the people. And if you change the people and you get another person, they come in and you still got that same problem. And so what, what we had to do is, is we refocus back on changing the process and get the focus off the people. And so that's, that's one issue you come into. Another issue that, that you come into frequently across industries and, and no matter what the process is, uh, a lot of times uh, people want to own the whole thing and uh, they they want to delegate how it's going to be done and, and throw it over the fence and uh, to to the other stakeholder. And so we we have to navigate through that challenge and that issue of that propensity to want to control it and to to be able and to enable that ability to work together for the best possible solution. A lot of times that comes back to that win-lose men mentality, and that's kind of hard to get around with certain personalities, but but you want to get to that win-win. Uh, there has to be, there has to be a give and take. It, you know, in order to get to the best solution, you can't have all one side or all one another. There has to be a give and take and a willingness to listen. So um, that's the main ones. Yeah, and and that that touches also on the on the ability to diplomatically deal with the person who is the boss, and who either takes charge when they shouldn't in terms of telling other people what their jobs are and how you know rather than letting them contribute to the solution, or the situation where everybody. You ask somebody a question, and the first thing they do is turn and look at the boss to say, you know, what should I do? What should I say? So, 
Uh, that's another aspect of um, the, the group dynamics management that's that's so important in this area. Um, so I'm going to move on to a, the final poll for today. And uh, give me just a moment. And what we're going to ask is what topics our audience might be most interested in learning. And given your advice, um, when would right now be the best time to do it? <laughs> Are you asking me a question, Stuart, or are you giving them no, instructions? I've got, a poll. I've got a poll for the audience, I think. Okay, you should... okay. But, you know, we've, we've talked uh, about um, project management skills, Lean Six Sigma. We've talked about uh, RPA itself. We've talked in, in a lot of the things that are around. Um, in different related fields, but also, you know, as you said, people need to be continuously learning. So, you know, what does that imply for, you know, somebody who wants to, to learn one of these areas? Is when should they start? And we'll show the poll result here. So, a lot of interest in RPA. And, and Lean Six Sigma, as well as uh, some of the other uh, areas of data science and cloud computing. And it's good to see that uh, the most popular answer is start right away, which is a really good policy because you don't get anywhere until you take that first step. So with that, I'm going to... Um, Say thank you to Laura. I know that you have a slide that you want to share, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing on my side and let you do that. So I'm still grayed oh. out. There it goes. Can you see my slide? Not yet, but it should be coming up. You have uh, the permission now. Yep, there it comes. So there, there's my LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And also, uh, we will be posting two different entry-level uh, jobs, hopefully in the, over the next week. And one will be for an RPA business analyst, and one will be for an RPA developer. And so please take a screenshot and that they will be posted on our website listed there. So we'd love to hear from you. If you give me just a moment, I will also type this into the chat box. First horizon.com. First horizon. National Corporation. Okay. And you should see your chat box. If you're an attendee, you'll see the, uh, the link that Laura has on the slide there. Um, she's going to be posting job openings, as she said, in the coming week. So keep that in mind if this is something of interest and you've got the, the basic background already. And, and I will go ahead and take back the sharing. And so again, thank you, Laura. I want to thank everybody else for being here today. Um, I do want to remind you, and I think I've dropped this into the chat box as well at some point, um, our Skill Up program from Simply Learn is the free program that allows you to access a lot of the video content that we have for our courses, 
over 300 skills, a um, lot of different technologies, including some of the ones that Laura has uh, emphasized. And you can find that at the link in the chat box or at simplylearn.com slash skillup dash free dash online dash courses. Um, and our next webinar will be next um, in two weeks, actually, almost two weeks, Wednesday, the March 24th. Uh, there will be a webinar with a group VP from Oracle Customer Experience Marketing, Trishti Slafat, who um, will be talking about product development focus, automation, intelligence, and simplicity, a somewhat related topic in terms of using automated processes to um, generate consumer um, experiences. So please do join us for that. And want to thank you again, all of you, including Laura, for being here today. Uh, we invite you to keep track of us on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thank you, Stuart. It was a pleasure. The same here, Laura. Great conversation with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.